very few countries have been explored and excavated by archaeologists as much as Egypt has, but very few countries still contain so much ancient wonder. Perhaps that's partially down to the sheer volume of history that Egypt has. It's a country so old that the pyramids were already ancient when Cleopatra took the throne. Here's a whistle-stop video tour of some of the most striking discoveries made in Egypt recently. The location of the mummy of Queen Nefertiti is one of the great unknowns of ancient Egyptian history, but that may be about to change. In September 2022, the prominent Egyptologist Zaki Hawass announced to the world that he will soon be able to declare with certainty that a mummy he's been studying is that of the legendary queen. Finding the remains of Nefertiti has been a lifelong obsession for Hawass, who was once Egypt's Minister of State for Antiquities Affairs. He believes that she once served as pharaoh, although that's a controversial claim among historians. What we do know about her is that she was born somewhere close to 3,370 years ago and lived for about 40 years. She was the wife of Akhenaten and also the mother of Tutankhamun, and she may have taken the throne when her husband died. History records a three-year reign for someone called Smenkare after the death of Akhenaten, but Hawass believes that Smenkare was actually Nefertiti. He also believes that the mummy currently known as KV-21A, so named because it was found in Tomb 21 of King's Valley, is that of Nefertiti. We await his proof. Historians have been arguing about how the Egyptians built the pyramids for hundreds of years. We may never get a definitive answer to that question, but a new possibility emerged in August 2022. It's now thought that some of the building materials for the pyramids were transported to the site via an arm of the Nile River that's long since dried up and been forgotten. A study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on August 29th contains an analysis of pollen samples collected from earthen cores around the pyramids, seemingly proving that there was a waterscape there 4,500 years ago when the Great Pyramid of Giza was built. This previously unknown branch of the Nile has been named the Khufu branch, in honor of the Great Pyramid itself, which was built for Khufu. The branch would have served as a natural canal, allowing ancient workers to float the materials they needed almost up to the precise location they wanted them. The theory doesn't quite explain how these enormous blocks of stone were then manipulated into position, but we suppose we can't have everything. Archaeological excavations have been going on for so long at the Saqqara necropolis in Giza that archaeologists there had started to think that they'd seen everything. But they were wrong. In September 2022, research teams found several massive blocks of white cheese. The cheese is still intact, despite being made 2,600 years ago, and has survived for this long because it was safely stored within clay receptacles. This particular type of cheese was known to the Egyptians as Haram. By the Coptic era, the word had become Haloum. Today, we know it as Halloumi cheese. The clay containers encasing the cheese are marked with demotic script, the same form of ancient Egyptian writing that appears on the Rosetta Stone, but researchers have not yet released a translation of the inscriptions. Because of that, we're not yet able to confirm who the cheese was buried with, or why it was buried. Perhaps somebody who was buried in the necropolis simply had a strong love of cheese, and their friends and relatives thought it would be wrong to send them to the afterlife without any. The sands of Egypt are still hiding many tombs from the country's ancient days of empire, and not all of them are worth reporting when they're discovered. This one, found in Saqqara in late 2018, however, definitely is. It's approximately 4,400 years old, and as far as experts can tell, it's never been broken into, robbed, or otherwise interfered with since the day it was sealed until now. Because of that, the bright colors on the walls of the tomb, which is said to belong to a well-respected priest by the name of Watye, haven't faded over the years, and in many places, are still in pristine condition. 
Finding a tomb in condition this good is extremely rare, and Egyptologists say that this is the single best example for at least three decades. The hieroglyphs above the entrance to the tomb indicate that Wati was closely connected to King Neferikare, who ruled during the fifth dynasty of the Old Kingdom. Among his many duties, he was the royal purification priest and the inspector of a sacred boat. The tomb, which is 20 feet below the sand, is divided into five separate shafts. They're being opened slowly and carefully, one at a time. One of them will presumably contain the sarcophagus of Wati himself. Buhan was once one of the mightiest fortresses in Egypt. It existed on the west bank of the Nile, just north of the river's second cataract, in what's now northern state Sudan. It wouldn't be much use as a fortress today because it's almost entirely submerged in Lake Nasser. Aside from functioning as a settlement in its own right, the fortress protected an Egyptian settlement that existed opposite it on the east bank, where the Sudanese town of Wadi Haifa stands today. There's almost nothing left of the settlement, but we can provide historical context for the creation of Buhen thanks to its mention on stele created during the reign of Senusret I 3,900 years ago. As far as historians are aware, Buhen was the first Egyptian settlement ever to be built in the land once known as Nubia, predating the East Bank settlement that it once overlooked. But there may have been an Egyptian settlement there prior to the establishment of the fortress. There's archaeological evidence at the site that copper working went on there between 4,600 and 4,100 years ago, and the Egyptians are the most likely candidates to have carried this work out. In October 2018, archaeologists confirmed the discovery of the so-called booth of Ramses II within the Mataria neighborhood in the Egyptian capital city of Cairo. When we say booth, we of course don't mean a photo booth. Instead, we're talking about a seat. It wouldn't be entirely accurate to say that the seat was a throne, but instead it's a specific seat where Ramses II would have sat during public events conducted at the location during his reign 3,200 years ago. Ramses II is sometimes better known as Ramses the Great. He was the 19th dynasty's third pharaoh, and in the eyes of many historians, its most accomplished, ruling the country for almost 50 years and overseeing several successful military campaigns in the Levant, regaining control over Canaan in the process. News of those successful campaigns may even have been delivered at this exact location in Cairo, with the king sitting in his booth so he could receive the acclaim of his adoring public. The seat itself is no longer present at the site, but the platform and the stairs that lead up to it are still clearly visible. Speaking of structures created specifically for Egyptian monarchs, here's the Bark Station of Queen Hatshepsut. It was discovered on Egypt's Elephantine Island in April 2016. A bark, for those unfamiliar with the term, is a kind of ancient boat that the Egyptians used almost from the dawn of their civilization. Some of the oldest artworks and reliefs in Egypt contain depictions of barks. At one early stage, the Egyptians believed that a bark could even transport a person to the afterlife. A bark station is, therefore, a boat station, and in the case of this one, it's a place where the sacred boats of Hatshepsut were positioned before and after they were used in processions during the festival of the deity known as Knun. Ensuring that the barks always looked resplendent and were fit for duty was a responsibility that would fall upon the priests at the temple outside which the station was located. At some point long after the end of Hatshepsut's time, the station was taken apart, and 30 of its largest stone blocks were used in the foundations of the Kanum Temple of Nectanebo II, which is where the discovery was made. Our next discovery is much more personal in nature. It's a letter home from an Egyptian soldier stationed in Pannonia Inferior in what's now Hungary, written 1,800 years ago. The soldier was an Egyptian recruit into the Roman army which explains why he had the distinctly un-Egyptian name of Aurelius Polion. Aurelius was part of Legio II Edutrix and wasn't enjoying himself at the time he wrote his letter. 
In it, he complains that nobody has written to him in some time, and that most of the soldiers have been furloughed because there's nothing to do. The letter was found in the Egyptian city of Teptunis in 1899. There are several chunks missing from the badly damaged letter, but there's enough of it left that we can see Aurelius addressed it to several people simultaneously, including his mother, brother, and sister. He complains that he's written six times but heard nothing back, and is now concerned about their health and how they're faring. He promises that if they write back and say that they need him, he'll request leave from his commander and come home at once. We wonder whether he ever did. Would Egypt have become as mighty as it did during ancient times were it not for the Kopesh? That's a difficult question to answer, but there are many people who think that the sword played a key role in helping the Egyptians to forge an empire. The curved sword was standard issue for Egyptian warriors during the Bronze Age. It's the oldest style of sword in North Africa and considerably more efficient than any battlefield weapons available to the enemies of Egypt at the time. However, the Kopesh wasn't invented in Egypt. It's thought that the first blades of this kind were created by the Mesopotamians about 4,500 years ago. There's also a depiction of the Sumerian ruler Inatum of Lagash wielding a Kopesh on the stele of the vultures, which is also around 4,500 years old. Egypt cottoned on to the idea about 3,500 years ago during the time of the New Kingdom and used them to repel invasions from sea peoples. Neighboring Canaan was less successful in that endeavor, and that might have been down to the simple fact that they didn't have the Kopesh to call upon. For all of its sophistication compared to the cultures around it, a lot of ancient Egyptian medicine was based on herbs. Much of what we know about Egyptian medical herbal knowledge comes from a document known as the Ebers Papyrus. The papyrus has been tested and dated to around 1550 BCE, placing it within either the Second Intermediate Period or the Early New Kingdom Era. It's one of the oldest medical documents ever found in Egypt, and is so named because it was purchased by the German Egyptologist and novelist George Ebers in Luxor in 1873. The artifact is still in Germany today and can be viewed by the public in the library of the University of Leipzig. While scientists are positive about the papyrus being around 3,550 years old, modern-day Egyptologists believe that its contents may have been copied from even older texts. There are more than 700 formulas, recipes, and remedies outlined within the text, covering everything from the treatment of blood disorders to suggestions for ridding the body of disease-causing demons. Despite the slightly fantastical nature of its more outlandish treatments, the text correctly identifies that the heart is the center of the body's blood supply, something that wasn't known in other parts of the world until several centuries later. We should talk about Hatshepsut again before we finish this video, and so we shall. This is the monumental mortuary temple of Hatshepsut in the Valley of the Kings. Hatshepsut was one of ancient Egypt's most successful queens, and her 22-year reign is thought to be one of the most prosperous in Egyptian history when it occurred some 3,500 years ago. Perhaps because of the level of reverence her people had for her, the Egyptians of old spent a whole 15 years building her mortuary. Perhaps the most notable features within the mortuary are two long colonnades, sequences of columns upon which the great achievements of the pharaoh are recorded in the form of carvings and reliefs. They depict Hatshepsut as a master trader and diplomat who brought fantastic wealth back to Egypt as tributes from neighboring lands. Years later, subsequent rulers of Egypt would try to illegitimatize Hatshepsut's reign, declaring that no woman could ever truly be a pharaoh. They tried to destroy many of the monuments at the mortuary, which is why many of the statues are defaced. They failed in their efforts, though. This glorious temple is still here today. Archaeologists work on Egyptian sites every day, but they don't get to make all the discoveries. In 2019, drilling work on a sewage drain in Tama Sohag had to be called to a sudden halt when workers realized they'd accidentally broken into an ancient temple. Archaeologists were summoned immediately, 
and they were overjoyed when they realized that the workers had stumbled across the long-lost temple of Ptolemy IV, which was now open to the air for the first time in 2,200 years. Ptolemy isn't remembered by history as a successful or popular pharaoh. He was said to be much more interested in art and hedonism than he was in governing, which might explain why his temple is in an out-of-the-way location on the western bank of the Nile. It certainly explains why he was deposed by his own people, who accused him of being more interested in making art than he was in leading the country. On the other hand, he did build the largest human-powered sailing vessel ever made, the Tessera Contaris, with its crew of 4,000. The temple is less spectacular than temples made for Egypt's more successful pharaohs, but is arguably more interesting for that same reason. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.